Well, you know, the project begins with uh, the wonderful invitation uh, from Henry Louis Gates to deliver the Nathan Huggins Lectures, which for any historian is one of the great honors, uh, you know. And I decided that I wasn't going to uh, just simply deliver work that was in progress, which is a common thing. And um, I was writing about jazz, I was writing this book on Thelonious Monk. And I decided, well, let me come up with a topic that allows me to continue my work on Monk but didn't really break out of it. And at the time, I kept discovering, following Monk's trajectory, that Monk was a global figure, and that many of the artists who were uh, close to him had his interest in Africa. Um, Randy Weston and Ahmed Abdul Malik, two major figures in the book. Uh, were, you know, Weston was Monk's very close friend and a fellow pianist. Ahmed Abdul Malik was his regular bass player. And both, in their own ways, were exploring a fusion between sort of West African and North African music and jazz, and trying to experiment, and push the limits. Monk himself wasn't doing that, but, but these men around him were. Uh, on the other side, I discovered that in Africa itself, Thelonious Monk was was a hero. You know, he had never gone to South Africa, but all these South African jazz musicians, uh, people like Kipi Moketsi, Abdul Ibrahim. Uh, and the person I ended up writing about, Satima B. Benjamin, all really loved Monk. And, you know, Benjamin and her husband, Abdul Ibrahim, met Monk finally in Europe, and that was like a great meeting of minds. I mean, you know, for Monk to actually hear uh, an African pianist say, you know, your music has been so influential to me. I mean, that was really significant. And then finally, there's another character that kept coming up in my book, uh, a man named Guy Warren, or later known as Kofi Ganaba. Uh, he was a drummer, born in Ghana, uh, who, you know, like many West Africans living in cities like Accra or Lagos, Nigeria, they knew jazz. You know, they knew the music. Uh, the music was already global. So in the 19, uh, early 1950s, late 40s, uh, Guy Warren decided, I'm going to you know, make a name for myself as a jazz drummer. And I'm going to play the jazz drum kit, but I'm, all, I'm going to bring to it uh, a kind of African rhythmic conception. Uh, I'm going to bring my traditional drums, my talking drums, and my djembe into the mix and make new music. So his goal, which he fulfilled, was to travel to the United States. And he got here, came to Chicago, 1954 and set out to make the first African jazz fusion album. You know? So part of what the book does is explore the lives and the works of these, con of these four artists uh, because in some ways they, they represent a kind of convergence. Uh, they knew each other in some ways, uh, sometimes they even worked together, but most importantly they each were on a particular path to figure out uh, on the U.S. side, how to make jazz more African, uh, and on the African side, how to make African music uh, connect to jazz. Um, and each one, each one of these four artists believed that jazz in its transformed way really did embody the modernity that represented Africa itself. You know, that jazz is modern music and African for modern people. Uh, and in some ways, uh, these were artists ahead of their time because in the 21st century, we could talk about post-modernity and, you know, pastiche and hybridity and these are terms we use all the time. Well, we know it always existed, but in the 1950s and 60s, there were those many of whom were very powerful critics, who said, you cannot put apples and oranges, you cannot you know, mix these forms, uh, because it just uh, you know, dilutes the purity of African music or the purity of jazz, you know, when we know that none of those are pure. Because these kinds of uh, transnational 
relationships and intercultural practices go way back. I mean, even in the origins of jazz, I mean, you're talking about, I mean, even if you accept the idea that jazz begins in New Orleans, well, what is New Orleans but the Caribbean? You know, it's a, the Caribbean basin. It's, and what is New Orleans but a, an, an, entry, an entrepot into Mexico? You have Mexican musicians and Caribbean musicians and, you know, Creole and French musicians, all in this kind of interesting international mix making this music. If you accept the argument, which I do, that jazz has another source of roots, and that's in New York City, well, who are those musicians? with Jay's, James Reese in Europe and others, Puerto Ricans, Cubans, West Indians, you know, all these different people are together making this music. So the music has always been transnational in the beginning. If there's ever a moment when jazz's roots, its American roots, become unmoored, it is in the 1950s and 60s because it is a moment of deep international exploration. It is a moment of of incredible travel and conversation and interaction. It is a moment when jazz, uh, with its global roots, truly becomes a global form of music. And those who argue vehemently that it's uniquely American, um, I think in some ways it's a defensive measure. You know, uh, One of my frustrations is that all the previous scholarship while willing to acknowledge the impact that American jazz had on the rest of the world, is less willing to acknowledge the impact that other forms of music and other jazz had on the U.S. Uh, and this is a problem. This is a problem we're going to have for a very, very long time. Uh, unless we are able to document the extent to which influence flows both ways, and that in flowing both ways, it's not African influence on, Amer on Americans or American influence on Africa that matters. It is the crashing and smashing and, and, and collaboration that produces even new music and moves us forward into things that no one's ever heard before. Africa.